Hi everyone and welcome to this week's crime and punishment story. This week I am covering the very tragic story of Thomas Thompson and the murder of William Thompson which took place in Gateshead in 1887. I hope you will find it interesting. But before we begin can I just say if you do enjoy this video then please give it a thumbs up and if you are new here or haven't already done so then do please consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. It is completely free to subscribe. It doesn't cost you any money, but it really does help to support the channel. And I would just like to add, as I always do now, that I do record these stories live, so I do sometimes make mistakes, which I always try to rectify. So I hope this does not spoil your enjoyment of the video. The past lives of those involved in this week's case were impossible to find due to the fact that one was just a child and that the family had been in various different workhouses in recent times. It was not really possible to find any information about them, so the past lives will be very basic. Thomas Thompson was said to be around 39 years old in 1887, so would have been born in around 1848. His place of birth and parents are unknown. He had been married, but it seems that his wife had died as he was bringing up his two children alone. The family were living in Gateshead and Thomas was described as a labourer. Herbert, the oldest son, was seven years old and William, the victim, was only four years old. It seems that on at least three occasions the children had been in different workhouses in the northeast area at the request of their father. No mention is given of Thomas being a heavy drinker. On the morning of January the 16th, Herbert Thompson awoke to find his father Thomas standing over him with a knife in his hand. It seemed he was attempting to cut his throat. Herbert was able to escape and ran towards the door. When he looked back, he saw his father lift his brother William from the bed where he had been sleeping. He shouted to William to wake up and run away, but although William tried to get away from his father, his father was too strong for him, and he cut the young boy's throat. Herbert was making so much noise at the doorway that a neighbour, Jane Strawn, heard him and ran for her mother, Mrs. Yeaman. When she arrived, she found Thomas sitting on the bed. He was not wearing any clothes, and William was lying beside him. She picked William up, and within minutes, the poor boy had died. Mrs. Yeaman's daughter ran into the street and began to shout out murder at the top of her voice. She was heard by a neighbour who went to fetch a policeman, and P.C. Rutherford quickly arrived at the house. He found poor William lying on the bed, covered in blood. He asked what had happened and who had done this, and Thomas said he had. He then handed P.C. Rutherford the bloodstained knife. A doctor was sent for and when he arrived he knew at once that nothing could be done for William. The cut to his neck had severed the jugular. Thomas was taken to the police station where he was later charged with the willful murder of his son William Thompson, to which he simply replied, not guilty. The inquest was held at the town hall in Gateshead before Coroner Graham. Jane Yeaman said she had identified the body as being that of William Thompson, son of the prisoner who was four years old. She would be recalled for further evidence later. Herbert Thompson said he was seven years old, he would be eight years old in April, and he lived with his father Thomas and his brother William in Gateshead. He said on January the 15th he had gone to bed as normal. He shared the bed with his father and William. He did not remember his father coming to bed that night, but when he woke the next morning, his father was standing over him with a knife in his hand. He said, the felt, he said he felt the knife on his chest, but after a little struggle, he was able to get away and ran towards the door. He looked back to where his brother William was sleeping and saw his father lift him up and lie him on the top of the bed. He said he shouted, Willie, me da will kill you. He said this made William wake up and he said although he tried he was not able to escape his father and he cut his throat. He said the knife that had been shown to the jury was the one his father had used. He said he was crying and shouting and a neighbour heard him. He said she ran for her mother and Mrs Yeaman was the first to arrive. He said she tried to help William but nothing could be done. She had asked his father, what have you done to this canny bairn? 
He said his father had told her it was better than going to the workhouse. He said they had been in the workhouse before, once at Hexham, once at Morpeth, and once at Gateshead. His father had not been with them. They had been in the workhouse as his father had no work and no furniture in the house. Thomas was allowed to ask questions and he asked if Herbert knew how long the knife had been in the house and he said he did not. Then Thomas, strangely addressing his son as little boy, said, Can you tell me, little boy, that you ever saw the knife in my possession? Herbert replied by simply saying, Yes, when you were going to cut me, I saw it. Herbert was then asked if one of his thumbs was cut and he replied yes, his dad had done it when he was trying to run away from him. Thomas then spoke to his son again, asking him repeatedly if anyone had spoken to him since the 16th. Herbert simply began to cry and Thomas said, I am sorry son, I don't want to make you cry, but I need to know if anyone has said things to you since Sunday. Herbert, who was still crying, said he had spoken to no one but the police. Jane Strawn said she was living with her mother in Gateshead in the rooms next to the Thompsons. She said on the morning of the 16th she had heard Herbert crying. She also heard him shout out, Oh, da, da, don't cut my neck. She said she knew it was him as she recognised his voice. She ran to her mother's room and they both went to Thomas's rooms. She said Thomas was sitting on the bed with no clothes on and William was lying on the bed covered in blood and Herbert was crying beside the door. She said her mother went to William and tried to help him, but nothing could be done. She then went outside and shouted out murder, and a policeman arrived a short time later. Thomas had also dressed and gone out, but she didn't think he'd gone for either the police or a doctor. She added that she had seen Thomas on the Saturday and he had asked her to give him the knife. He said he would sharpen it and then use it to cut bread for the children. The knife shown to the jury was the same one. When asked, she said she had seen blood on Thomas's chest when she had first arrived at his rooms. Jane Yeaman said she also lived in the rooms next to the Thompsons in Gateshead. She said she said she had been she said she had been in the Thompsons' house on Saturday night. She, sorry about that. She had been in the Thompsons' house on Saturday night. She had been the one to put the two boys to bed. She said she had not heard anything on the morning of the 16th, but her daughter had told her what she had heard, and she said they both went to see Thomas and his children. She also said Thomas was sitting on the bed with no clothes on. She said as soon as she saw William, she tried to lift him into her arms. She said he was still alive, but barely, and he died in her arms just a few moments later. She said she had spoken to Thomas and said, Oh, what have you done to that canny bairn, my poor little Winnie, that innocent bairn? She said Thomas had replied, saying, It's all right, missus, it's better that I did that than let them go to the workhouse. She said Thomas had dressed and gone out of the house just after William had died. William Collins said he lived in Gateshead. His home was opposite that of Thomas Thompson. He said on the morning of the 16th he had been in his kitchen when he had heard someone outside shouting, Murder! Police! He had looked out and seen Mrs. Strawn and her husband in the street, both still in their nightclothes. He said he had gone outside and spoken to, him, to them. They told him what had happened. He went up to the rooms and saw the poor boy. He said, Mrs. Yeaman said to him, Please go and fetch a policeman or somebody. He said Thomas was beside the bed dressing himself, but he did not seem to be Russian, so he himself ran out to find a policeman. P.C. Rutherford said he had been near Askew Road in Gateshead when he had heard the shouts. He was heading in the direction they were coming from when Mr. Collins found him and told him of the child's death. He said they were both heading towards the house when Thomas came up to him. He said, it's no good going any further because the job's done. He said he told him he would have to come back to the house with him and Thomas said he wanted to go to the station but P.C. Rutherford said he took no notice of him and took him back to the house. He said on entering the house he saw the child lying on the floor in a pool of blood. He said he asked Thomas who has done this and Thomas replied in a low voice, me. He asked Thomas what he had hurt the child with and he said he got up and went to the bed and removed a knife from under the pillow and handed it to him. P.C. Rutherford said he put the knife in his own pocket. 
He said Thomas was then taken to the police station and charged with the willful murder of William Thompson. He said Thomas just replied with the words, not guilty. He did not make any further statements. Dr K said he had been sent for by Sergeant Trotter and on his arrival at the house he had found the body of a little boy lying on the bed. He said there was nothing that could be done for him. He said he had also performed the post-mortem on the body of William Thompson. He said he had a large cut to his throat which had severed the jugular and the cause of death had been blood loss due to the wound. He had also examined Thomas at the police station. He said he had not found any blood stains on his clothing. His hands and body seemed to be very dirty, but they did also appear that he had to have been wiped down with a cloth of some kind. He said Thomas had spoken to him at the time and said, I know what you are looking for. I got dirty on Saturday night when I was drunk and I wiped myself with a bit of old cloth. He said although Thomas's hands seemed to shake a little, he did not seem to be distressed and answered all questions in a calm manner. Dr Kay said he had later been shown the blood-stained knife and the stains had been fresh and he had also been shown a blood-soaked cloth which was said to have been used by Thomas to wipe himself down. And Detective Jarvis said he had found the blood-stained cloth under a kitchen table in the house. Thomas, against the advice of the coroner, then made a rambling statement saying that no one had told the same story and that his son Herbert was only seven and did not know the law and had told things to the jury without realising the consequences of his words. He talked for quite some time, speaking of each witness and why their evidence was not correct, until he was asked, Are you not done? To which he replied, I will not be done for a long time. After talking for several more minutes, he was told that he would be best to keep his statements for the trial. The coroner then addressed the jury, stating that this was a most shocking case. Whether it was fear of the children going to the workhouse, drink or a frenzy, it was not clear, but all they had desired to decide was whether or not the life of this poor little boy had been taken by his father. And for this there was no doubt, not only from the evidence but from the prisoner's own admission. This was not a case that could be reduced to manslaughter, it was murder or nothing. The jury retired for only a few moments before returning a verdict of guilty of willful murder against Thomas Thompson and he was committed for trial. I did not find any evidence of a funeral for William Thompson. Sadly, it seems the family had no money and no mention was made of any other relatives in the area, so this would most likely have been a pauper's funeral. I did not find any evidence of a headstone for William anywhere in the area. The trial took place at the end of January in Durham before Mr Justice Day. Thomas pleaded not guilty to the charge. As is often the case, the majority of the evidence given at the trial is the same as that of the inquest, so I will only include any new details. Thomas was said to listen intently to all the evidence given. It was said he did not show any signs of emotion until Herbert repeated his evidence. At this, Thomas had put his head in his hands and cried. Herbert had also struggled to give the details of the moment that Thomas had killed his brother, sobbing uncontrollably. Dr Treadwell said he was the surgeon at Durham Prison. He said he had examined Thomas on several occasions. He said from their conversations he had come to the conclusion that Thomas was not of sound mind. He said he felt he was suffering from depression and delusions. He said he could not say if Thomas had known the difference between right and wrong on the 16th. However, he said Thomas believed that he would never get work and that if the child was dead, he would go to heaven and be better off. The judge was then asked if the trial should continue from this point on on the grounds of the prisoner being of unsound mind. However, the judge said this was for the jury to decide and the trial would continue as normal. The prosecution in summing up stated that he believed that Thomas was of sound mind and had known what he was doing when he had killed his son and he asked that the jury should hold him responsible for that crime. The defence, on the other hand, summed up based entirely on the idea that Thomas was not of sound mind and felt that the suggestion that Thomas may have been insane at the time the crime was committed was something that should be believed. 
The judge summed up telling the jury that it was for them to decide if Thomas had been aware of what he was doing when he had committed the crime, and he also pointed out that none of the witnesses had expressed the opinion that Thomas had shown any signs of insanity. The jury retired for one hour and fifteen minutes before returning a verdict of guilty of willful murder. Thomas was asked if he had anything to say, and Thomas stated, I hold that I am not guilty of willful murder because I believe I did good. I was doing my duty towards God, man and my child. The judge, now wearing the black cap, then addressed Thomas, saying, You have been found guilty of a most awful crime. I believe the jury have reached the correct verdict, that you knew that what you were doing was wrong. The sentence of the law is that you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead and that your remains will be buried within the grounds of Durham Prison and may God have mercy on your soul. Thomas, before being removed from the dock, said he wished to thank his defence, saying, I thank him very kindly and I thank you all. A petition for a reprieve was started very soon after the trial, stating that Thomas was not of sound mind. Due to this, Thomas was examined by two local doctors and also a doctor from London, and they all agreed that Thomas was not of sound mind, and three weeks after the sentence had been passed, it was commuted to one of penal servitude for life. I did not find any details of where Thomas was sent to after this, though it is most likely that he would have been sent to Broadmoor Lunatic Asylum. Although I do not know what happened to Herbert Thompson in later years, it is known that after his father's arrest, he was sent to the Abbott Industrial School in Gateshead, and he could still be found there in 1891. It is but a small consolation that he was not sent to the workhouse. This was an absolutely tragic case. Poor William was just a child with his whole life ahead of him, but it seems that Thomas, for reasons unknown, felt it was better to try and kill both of his children than to send them back to the workhouse. While I can understand that the workhouse was not a nice place, especially for children, I can't understand why he felt that death was better for them. Was he insane? Well, his rambling statement at the inquest did not suggest a man fully in control of his mind, but it was, does not suggest someone who was insane either. But what other explanation could there be for a man who thinks his children would be better off dead than in the workhouse? I can fully understand the jury finding Thomas guilty of willful murder. The judge had pretty much directed them towards the guilty verdict, and they did not truly have enough evidence to find him insane. I personally do not believe he could have been sane to have wished his two boys dead, no matter what his reasons were. Herbert was lucky to survive, and although sadly we do not know what happened to him in later life, he, at least, had a chance to live. Sadly, Thomas not, did not give poor William this chance, and I can hardly even begin to imagine how terrifying it must have been for both boys to have found their father standing over them with a knife in his hands. I think the reprieve probably was the correct thing to do. We do not have the full details of the doctor's findings when they examined him after the trial, but all three found him to be insane, making the reprieve the only thing that could have happened after this diagnosis was made. But what do you think? Do you think Thomas was insane, or do you think he knew what he was doing? Do you think a reprieve was the correct ending to this tragic story? And can you find any way at all to explain why Thomas felt his children would be better off dead? Especially when you consider that at no time did he suggest he was planning to take his own life after that of his children's. Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I do hope that you have found this very sad and tragic story interesting. I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.